This is a story from my childhood, one of the ones that haunt me to this day. Have you ever seen those memes where it says people react like a criminal when an unexpected visitor arrives on their doorstep? They freeze and drop everything they're doing and throw themselves to the floor to avoid being seen in a window? This is my story of how I became one of those people. At the time, I must have been around maybe seven. I was visiting Kansas from South Korea, where I was born and raised just visiting family, nothing major. On that particular night, the adults were going to have a date night. So our parents had ordered us pizza before they left and waited for it to arrive, for we wouldn't have to open the door for anyone. My aunt, uncle had two kids, two boys to be exact, and they were ages 15 and 8. Like I said before, I was maybe 7 at the time, my older sister was 11, and our baby brother was the young tender age of 3. So all in all, we're ready to just have a night of fun games, after all, it wasn't often the cousins got to get together like this. They lived in the States and we lived in Korea, but we love each other dearly. We saw our parents out at the garage entryway, they made sure we knew the rules and we could recite them back to them. They also made sure we knew where the telephones were and the emergency numbers to accompany them. It's just going to be a typical night of no parents, or so we thought. It had maybe been an hour, maybe two after our parents had left, we were downstairs in the basement in the playroom or the game room, whatever people like to call it these days, we were down there just watching movies, playing air hockey, things of that nature, just being kids. We weren't being loud or anything like that, and even if we were, it wouldn't be too big of a deal, because the way houses were in Kansas, the basements are built into the ground in case of a tornado. I had gone upstairs with my oldest cousin because I wanted a drink of chocolate milk, and I couldn't reach the cups alone, so we wandered upstairs into the kitchen, which was on the far end of the house, the others stayed downstairs continuing their games. We had maybe been upstairs for 15 to 20 minutes because while I was drinking my milk, my older cousin was making snacks since we were planning to watch a movie. Then all of a sudden, we hear the doorbell ring. I remember my cousin looked at me and told me to stay here because it was odd that the doorbell was ringing. It wasn't late, but it certainly wasn't early. And I say this because it was summer, it was around 8 o'clock. My cousin started to creep towards the door quietly. It was unnerving for someone to be ringing the doorbell, we weren't expecting any guests and the pizza had been delivered before our parents had even left for the evening. And before he's even halfway to the door, whoever's on the other side starts rapidly ringing the doorbell over and over the constant ringing echoing throughout the house. And by this point I had looked over toward the staircase and I saw our other siblings starting to creep up the stairs with the exception of the baby who was still asleep in the crib down in the guest room. The oldest of the kids named James put his finger to his lips and told us to be quiet to make it seem like no one was home, despite there being lights on. He crept closer to the door as the banging and ringing on the doorbell continued. He peeked through the peephole. I had never seen my cousin look so freaked out, his face drained of color and he backed away from the door rapidly and he told us all to go downstairs, but of course, we didn't listen. Honestly, we thought he was playing a joke. Maybe it was some of his friends wanting to scare us, since he did cancel his plans that night to stay home and watch all of the younger kids. My older sister shoved past him and looked through the peephole herself, and for whatever reason, whatever was on the other side of the door made her have the same exact reaction and she stumbled back from the door just as pale. At the time, I didn't understand what was going on. I don't think any of us younger kids really did, but something wasn't right. After a while, whoever was at the door stopped ringing the doorbell and all was quiet again. It seemed like they gave up. Maybe they thought no one was home. If only we knew how wrong we really were. We all sat in silence for a while after this initially occurred. My other cousin, who I'm just going to call Kyle for the purpose of the story, mustered up the courage to ask his brother James, who was at the door and why James and my sister were acting so skittish. James told us that there was a man wearing dark clothes and seemed to be carrying some type of a package or large box, but he couldn't see his face. Of course, Kyle being the little smarty pants he was at the time, started to mock James saying he was just being a scary cat and didn't recognize their neighbors. Kyle was convinced it was just a neighbor trying to drop off a package that might have got mixed up in the mail seeing it happened all the time. 
So we all agree, that was the probable cause, until we realized, whoever was ringing the doorbell, didn't just leave the package on the porch, which isn't that what most neighbors do. In the case no one answers, they'll just leave it. And why would they try to bring it over to the house at night instead of just waiting until the next day? But we thought it was over and done with, so we pushed to the back of our minds. We didn't think it was important to call our parents and let them know what happened. It was over after all. We went back to the kitchen, grabbed the snacks and started to head back downstairs until we heard banging again, but it wasn't from the front porch this time. We were in shock. We froze in fear. I mean, it was coming from right behind us. We turned slowly and looked back in the direction from which we came from. We were currently standing in the dining room we had already passed through the kitchen. It was like someone was banging on the kitchen window, you know the one that's typically above the sink, so your mother or your father can watch the kids while they play in the backyard while they wash the dishes? So James and my older sister, who were just going to call Nicole at this point, got down on their hands and knees, and they crawled back into the kitchen much against our charging. Just as quickly as they crawled into the kitchen to take a peek, they crawled back to us at almost hyper speed and they told us to get low and stay low as we crawled into the den further down the hallway. James had us all huddled close to the fireplace, out of sight from the windows. And he told us to stay there, he was taking charge, he was protecting his home and family the best he knew how. James quickly crawled away. I didn't know where he was going, but I was scared. The banging was getting louder and it was getting closer and closer. At some point, I started to cry. I remember Kyle put his hand over my mouth and my sister was hugging us tight. Around that time, we saw James starting to appear back around the corner and he had his baseball bat. He had crawled up another staircase to get to his room. He crawled past US and put a finger to his lips again and that's when we realized he was crawling towards the doggy door. He was attempting to close off the one entrance to the house that wasn't locked. Thankfully, he managed to get it latched in time because we don't think the man outside had realized the house had a doggy door, but when he heard the lock click into place the banging became more erratic, more violent. Then all of a sudden, much like before the banging stopped, we heard pacing someone walking back and forth across the porch, slowly, deliberately. Thump, thump, thump. Thump, his heavy boots thundered across the red oak porch. And then, without warning, the pacing stopped, and it became quiet, eerily quiet. Then the man called out, Won't you open the door? I have a package for you. We didn't respond. We stayed quiet, or as quiet as we could be with the way our hearts were pounding, and with how ragged our breathing was. The stranger called out again, Open the door. Again, we didn't answer. The man called out angrily, I said, open the door, I have a package, like before, we didn't answer, nor did we make any sudden movements. The man started banging again, this time, directly on the panel window of the room we were sitting and yelling, I know you're in there, I know you can hear me open the door, or I'll open it for you. Bang, 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 the window rattled and shook violently with each impact from the strange man. Thankfully, our cousin's house had reinforced windows, so they weren't easy to break, but unluckily we didn't have any neighbors close by, so we didn't think anyone could hear the commotion. But while he was making all this noise, we took the opportunity to book it into another room and get to a phone. At one point, while we were on the phone with the police officers, they asked us if we could describe the man. And all we know is that he was tall and wearing black. So Kyle and I decided to be brave, so if something did happen to us that night, they would at least have a better description of who did it. We crawled back into the den, and we dared to look out of a small corner of the window. We gently moved the curtains out of the way, and Lord, behold, the man was still banging. He had moved the shutters off outside of the window. They're basically hanging off their hinges at this point rattling with the wind. We made eye contact with the deranged man, direct soul-searching eye contact. I don't think before this night I had ever believed, but there's pure evil in the world, but when I looked into that man's eyes, I didn't see a soul. I know it sounds crazy, but those were not the eyes of a human. He was something unlike anything I've ever seen before. Animalistic may be the only word I could describe it as besides demonic. It was evil, unnatural, and something I never want to see again. 
When he saw us, he smiled a twisted grin that I'm sure he thought I was reassuring, and he crouched down, for he could get a better look at us, I assume, and then he said, Don't you want your mail? You have mail, I can give it to you if only you open the door. I remember just grabbing onto Kyle's hand for dear life. And Kyle shook his head no, and he threw the curtain back over the window, and before we even had a chance to move any further, the man started violently banging on the window again. At this point James had enough he passed the phone to my sister and he yelled. Leave us alone. The police are on their way. You're not getting in here. After that, it seemed like the man panicked and the banging abruptly stopped. Then we heard rapid footsteps on the porch. Kyle and I peeked out the window again and the man was running through the yard past all the trees and he jumped the fence at the end of the yard into the alley that separated the neighborhood from the old cemetery. We stayed on the phone with police until they arrived and our parents arrived not long after, but the man was never caught and we don't know what happened after that night, he just disappeared into thin air. To this day, whenever the doorbell rings when I'm not expecting a visitor, my heart drops and I break out in a cold sweat. Mystery Package Man Let's Not Meet Again I am a 24-year-old female and I used to go to the smaller university in my city where I worked as a bartender at the university bar. I also lived about five minutes away from campus, which was really convenient most of the time for naps between classes, but it lost its touch after this encounter. I usually worked day shifts on days I didn't have any classes and my best friend, Dan, also worked with me there. We're really close, so he would hang out during my shift before relieving me most nights. I've known Dan for years and, although a sweetheart, he is often quite oblivious. One day, while Dan was sitting at the bar entertaining me during my shift, a guy sat next to him. The guy seemed normal, around my age, and wasn't bad looking either. He had blonde, disheveled hair and pretty sculpted muscles. He had also clearly come from a construction site because he had work boots and a hard helmet hanging from his belt. This wasn't unusual because we did have a lot of construction near us and most construction workers in the area were also students at the university. I struck up a conversation with him, going through all of the customer service chit chat that I was used to saying. When I was busy with another customer, he turned to Dan and started chatting with him and they seemed to get on quite well. However, I could tell every now and again that the guy kept sneaking glances at me, which was flattering the first couple of times and not uncommon as a female bartender. But the longer he did it, I realized there was something about him that was off when he looked at me. Rather than flirtatious, it was like he was watching me. Watching exactly what I was doing, where I was going, how I walked, how I greeted people, it was like he was surveilling me. Sizing me up, even. This really set me off for the obvious reasons, but also because I've dated a couple of abusive, controlling guys in the past and the behavior seemed all too familiar. This was when he started to loop me in on him and Dan's conversation. He asked if we knew each other. Obvious answer, yes. We had been joking with each other when he arrived. He then asked how we met and kept asking personal questions about the two of us. I already saw his ramp up coming a mile away before he asked if we were dating. Dan laughed because we get that all the time, we're really close and very comfortable with each other platonically. Dan, being his oblivious self, said no and that he was dating his girlfriend, but that I was single. I immediately saw a shift in demeanor from the guy, who then turned to me to smile. Although a pretty ordinary response, it sent chills down my spine. Many people would just think he was happy to be able to flirt with me freely, but the look in his eyes was telling. He was pleased because he wanted me to be himself. Now, to take a step back, I know that seems like a slight overreaction, but trust me, I know that type of look and it was frightening as all hell. After that, he started asking me personal questions specifically. I tried to go to other customers and act busy to avoid them. Sometimes Dan would answer for me, and I swear the dumb kid thought he was wingmanning me, but God, he was so, so wrong. The guy asked me how old I was, what I was studying at school, where I was from, and all other kinds of normal, but slightly invading questions as a stranger. Finally, Dan got up to get on shift, which meant that mine was almost over. 
because the guy didn't really do anything out of the norm, I didn't pull Dan aside, but just patiently waited until I could just go and have a beer far away from this guy. As Dan went into the back, the guy turned his sole attention to me. He asked me what kind of shows I liked to watch, and I answered half-heartedly as I cleaned behind the bar near him. Then, suddenly, I looked up and saw that his face was inches from mine. He had leaned up onto the bar, and I could literally smell him, that's how close he was. He then asked me if I lived alone. I did, at that time, but there was no way in hell I was telling this creep that. So I gulped, shook my head, and said I lived with two roommates. I thought adding two bodies would deter him. He leaned back down onto his seat and hummed. I saw a gleam in his eye that left me convinced he knew I was lying. At this point, I was shaking, which is really frustrating and unusual for me because I often keep up a rather stoic appearance when it comes to creeps. He seemed to notice and smiled. Then, with a nod, he got up and put on his jacket. See you later, Gemma. And then he left. Just in time for Dan to come out from the back, the bastard. Dan saw immediately how shaken I was and asked what was wrong. I could barely respond because the thing was, I never introduced myself to the guy. I'd forgotten to. And no one around had said my name. I know, because I asked Dan if anyone had. But the guy knew my name. Unfortunately, that's not the end of this story. After that encounter, I was on high alert for about four days. Then, I got busy with studying and life stuff and it went to the back of my mind. But not for long. Suddenly, I started seeing the guy everywhere. In the hallways, near my classes, and at the bar. Coincidence turned into obvious intent and I was freaked out. My university was small and there was very little for me to do to avoid him. My biggest worry was that he had seen the way I walked home, so I started to ask people to drive me even though I lived five minutes away. None of my friends minded because they're very solid, which I'm very thankful for. After about three weeks of this, I had started to tell my friends, who then started a sort of barrier around me. I was never alone outside of class, and I was always taken home by someone. I started to feel safer, and I had some other shit to deal with so the guy sort of left my mind for a bit again. During that time, I bought a pair of old school, yellow vans because I am a huge fan of retail therapy when I'm depressed and or anxious. About four days later, I got the notice saying that they were out for delivery, and I was pretty excited. I don't usually buzz delivery guys into my building and often just let them leave a notice so I can pick the package up, but I decided to buzz the guy in this one time. Immediate gratification or whatever. Anyway, I had work late and was dropped off at home by a friend around 10 p.m. I was exhausted but still stoked to get my vans and have a small positive in my life. But when I rounded the corner to my door, my package wasn't waiting for me. This was weird because they always bring your box to your door when it's a private courier. I shrugged it off, thinking maybe the delivery guy hadn't found my door number or maybe delivered it to the wrong apartment. I unlocked my door, which seemed to stick a little which was also weird, but I shrugged that off too. But when I opened my door, something immediately felt off. Nothing was out of place, but it felt like it. I cautiously stepped into my apartment, gripping my keys between my fingers. My other hand was holding my phone tight, just on the verge of pressing down my emergency call button. That's when I turned to the one thing that wasn't there when I left that morning, my package. It was sitting on my kitchen counter, with a note next to it. I started to panic and raced through my apartment wielding my keys like a pair of claws. My apartment was small, so it was rather easy to sweep it. No one was there. Just me, my vans, and the note. Going into survivor mode, I slammed my door, locked and bolted it, and stuck a chair under the handle for good measure. I checked every window to make sure they were locked, and that my patio door was as well, which was a sliding glass door. That's when I found the second thing out of place. The security bar I stuck behind my patio door was under my couch, where you would have had to be crawling to find it. It was most definitely stuck behind my patio door when I left that morning. As you can imagine, this freaked me out even more, but I was just glad the bar wasn't broken. 
I placed it back as tight as possible and then went straight towards my kitchen counter where the bastard had left me my present. My package was open, and my first thought was, hey, that's illegal before I reminded myself that the guy had literally just broken into my home. My shoes were intact, basically untouched. Next to the box was a handwritten note on one of the sticky pads from my desk in the other room. It read, small apartment for three people. Enjoy your vans. Now, I'd like to tell you that I called the police and that I got everything sorted out. But that's not how this story ends. In fact, all I did was cry the whole night and have around five panic attacks. The police can't really do much when a guy hasn't done anything malicious, and there was no way for me to trace all of this back to one guy I didn't even know and haven't seen since. However, the school term ended right after this, and I didn't have to go to campus until September. I also immediately moved in with my two sisters and brother-in-law, so he had very little ways to bother me after that. I was somewhere between the ages of 10 to 14 when this happened. Growing up I lived on a very boring street in a middle class one story house. My bedroom faced the front veranda which had a lot of plants. Just around the corner and down the hall from my bedroom was a study that was used as a spare room and a computer room. I used to watch TV in that room and on this particular night, it was very hot so I had opened the door to the veranda. There was a thin fly screen with no lock which we would pull across when that door was open. When I went to bed it was so hot that I kept my bedroom windows and curtains wide open. I was having trouble sleeping and laid there staring at the ceiling. Then I heard what sounded like someone walking around on the veranda. The ground was cement pebbles, there was a lot of dirt from the pot plants, and it made a very distinct sound when you walked on it. At first I assumed it was one of my parents, but it was very late at night and that wouldn't have made any sense. I craned my neck to look out the window. In the dark I saw a gaunt, skeletal, hunched over figure slowly shuffling towards my bedroom window. It made a raspy sound as it shuffled around. I was fairly certain it couldn't see me, but from the way its head was moving it looked like it was searching for something. Despite this fairly creepy thing happening outside my bedroom window, I still felt somewhat safe in the comfort of my bed inside my locked house. Then I realized I had left the steady door open. All that stood between whatever the hell this thing was and my house was a thin screen door with no lock. I knew I had to lock that door, and fast. This thing was almost at my bedroom window and would soon be at the steady door. I slid out of bed and crawled on my stomach out of my room and down the hall to study. As I reached the door, intending to quickly close it, I realized my mistake I would have to open the screen door in order to reach the door to close it. From where I was laying, I could see this thing hunched over and peering into my bedroom window. I think it heard or sensed me laying there because it turned and shuffled over and bent down to where I was laying. I held my breath as this thing put its face right against the screen and peered in at me, its raspy breath sounding like death. In the dark I could make out part of a face, it looked gaunt, sickly either with very thin or no skin. I couldn't see any eyes, or they were simply empty sockets. I didn't move as its face pressed up against the fly screen, seemingly looking right at me. Suddenly its face distorted in terror, its eye sockets and mouth opening wide, and it let out a blood-curdling shriek, a shriek that sounded like fear, and it bolted off into the night. I lay there silently, frozen in fear and disbelief over what had just happened, and listening to make sure it was gone. As soon as I dared to move I quickly opened the fly screen and shut and locked that veranda door. I then went back to my room and shut the windows and drew the curtains. I kept peeking through the curtain, expecting it to come back, but it never did. I've thought about this encounter ever since and I've never really been sure what to make of it. I've never told anyone about it either, I didn't know where to begin and I've never understood why it reacted in fear when it saw me. I used to be a tour guide in a popular tourist town in Tennessee. My job at the time was to take people on a circuitous two-mile walk around the town, telling them the ghost stories of the people who had lived there. During the summer, tours started a little before sundown and would end well after dark. All in all, it would take us roughly one to two hours to get through a tour, depending on the walking speed of my group. 
Just to preface this, the vast majority of stories we told were not true. They were either largely exaggerated, entirely fabricated, or simply gruesome stories of local murders with a paranormal twist added at the end with the ghost of the killer still lurking about. I didn't write the script, don't blame me. In fact, I visited a local museum and sourced authentic ghost stories from a curator in order to add a few of my own to the tour, which were actually authentic. That said, there were a handful of times during my stint as a tour guide in which I had experiences that were not so easily explained. In this post, I'm going to detail three of the most interesting ones. Story 1 One of the tools we got for our tours were EMF detectors, which I'm sure you're mostly all familiar with. They're intended to scan for electromagnetic frequencies and will detect the relative strength of a signal they pick up. Now, just because one of these things goes off doesn't mean you're seeing a ghost. They also pick up power lines and will go off like crazy near a generator. But if you're in the middle of nowhere and you suddenly get a strong signal, it's worth looking into. Now these detectors we used had about five lights on them, changing in hue from green to yellow to red. Red means no signal, and green indicates a strong signal. The light never goes below red unless you turn the thing off. That's the baseline. At the end of our tour, we would come to an old graveyard. Nobody has been buried there in at least 100 years. After I did my thing with the final story, people would wander around and look at the graves with flashlights and scare themselves shitless. But one night as they were wandering, a man called me over to see one of the graves. I went over and had a look and saw what the problem was. Whenever he passed his EMF detector over this particular grave, all the lights would turn off. The entire machine would turn itself off when it was over this grave and turn back on as soon as you moved it away. We tried with a couple other graves, but only this one had the effect. We were curious about the grave, so we tried to read the name of the person, but the headstone was too worn down for us to read it. The first name Thomas was faintly able to be read, but the surname was too hard to read. We had the whole group of five people leaning over it at this point trying to read it, when we all heard the same thing. As one of the group wondered aloud what the man's surname was, a loud voice from behind us shouted Whaley. As you may have guessed, there was nobody behind us when we turned around, and we called the tour to a close shortly after that. I never messed with that specific grave again, except to place some flowers on it one time, as was my habit every once in a while, since nobody visited that place anymore. Story 2 at the end of the tour, sometimes I would get tips if people had fun slash got spooked. Older Boomer and Gen X men really enjoy the charade of the covert handshake tip, where they palm you the money as they shake your hand. I always indulged a bit, because hey, I was getting a tip. One tour I ran had a family of three, a mother, father, daughter, and an older man who I initially thought was grandpa, but later learned had been lumped into their group because we didn't run solo tours. The old guy was pretty quiet throughout the tour, but would occasionally ask very pointed questions that stood out to me as odd. I don't remember most of his questions anymore this was years ago, but one example is that I was telling a story of a girl who fell from a balcony and her ghost haunts the river she plummeted into to this day, and he asked me if I thought she died right away when she hit the ground, or whether I thought she died slow and suffered. Just weird things like that. Well, at the end of the tour, the family took off into the graves to have a look about, see if ghosts would show up in their pictures, etc. Old man came to give me that typical handshake, and mentally I was thinking that all his weird behavior could be easily forgotten if he tipped well. The handshake was normal except that his hand was ice cold, but old folks have cold hands, so I didn't think about it too much. Except he didn't palm me a dollar, he palmed me a coin. I thought it was a half dollar when I felt it at first, but it was too big. I turned to glance at the guy as he walked past me to leave, and I shit you not, he was just gone. The path leaving the graveyard was downhill and you had visibility from the top for at least 300 feet. There was no way he could have covered that distance in that time, and I didn't even hear running. Just this old, tottering man in front of me one second and gone in the blink of an eye when he walked past me. When I got home and looked up the coin, I learned it was a one troy ounce silver bullion. Minted to an older year, I don't remember exactly. I can check the year when I get home this evening if anyone cares. 
Overall, the experience left me a little shocked, and the family agreed he was really odd when I walked them back to their car. Apparently, the guy greeted their daughter by name when they arrived at the meetup spot a few minutes before me, but they had no idea who he was. Story 3 So two weird experiences, but no ghostly apparitions or demonic screams. Unfortunately, most nights on the ghost tour were entirely mundane. However, I have got one more odd story I experienced which really set my belief in ghosts in stone. One of the earlier stops in our tour was an old cabin where the town's progenitor once lived. The cabin has been moved around a couple of times to build parking garages, but has since been placed back on its original spot. We don't actually have a photo of the woman who founded the town, but we have got pictures of her granddaughter, who everyone at the time swore was a dead ringer for her grandmother. Because of this, an old black and white photo of her granddaughter is on the sign outside the cabin. The cabin is kept locked up with a padlock at all times except when the historical society opens it up for school groups. The windows are so dirty you can't see inside, and most of the time it's too dark to get a decent look inside anyway. Regardless, I like to encourage people to peek through the cracks in the old wood because they'd psyche themselves into thinking they saw something move, and a spooky tour is a tour with good tips. Anyway, one night after I did the whole spiel about her founding the town, and how people say they can see her ghost within the cabin on some nights to this day, I let them all have a go at peeking inside. One of the younger teens in the group approached me after looking inside, and we had a very odd conversation. These kids to 13 to 16 usually think it makes them cool to be skeptical and show everyone they're not scared. So he asked me something like, Who's in the costume? I was a little confused and explained how the photo on the sign is a picture of the granddaughter of the town's founder, but that she wasn't wearing a costume, that was how people dressed at the time. The little shit rolled his eyes and told me he meant the woman in the cabin. Of course I had to have a look, so I peeked through, and sure enough, a street light was shining through the dirty windows and letting in a diffused sort of light, and you could just make out a figure in a rocking chair sitting in the corner of the dark cabin, rocking back and forth. It was hard to get a good look at her, but from what I saw, she did look just like the woman in the photo. I moved the group on pretty fast because quite frankly, I was a little afraid it was a homeless person who'd broken in somehow. If it was, I had a group of six kids and one parent homeschoolers I think. I didn't want anybody getting hurt or snatched. But I stopped by the cabin again on the way to my car and the lock was on tight and undamaged. I peeked inside again and there wasn't even a rocking chair in the cabin. In the whole time I worked the tour route, roughly two years, I never saw a chair in that cabin again. Or any old women, for that matter. So anyway, those are my stories. I know they aren't as sensational as some, but I thought I'd share my experiences with you all. I have a few more odd stories that I can share if you like, but they're all more explainable by mundane means, if not still creepy and odd. I want to preface this story by stating that I've had my fair share of encounters with creepy men. This situation, however, scared the life out of me. It's the first time I genuinely felt like my life was in danger. My husband and I had to drive 17 hours last week to North Carolina for a wedding. It was an exhausting week, and we basically spent the entire time rushing from one family gathering to another. We were staying in a motel for the time we were there. We had already been at this motel for a few days by the time the day of the actual wedding rolled around. The day of the wedding was hectic. We were rushing around trying to get ready to leave for the venue. My husband got ready before me so he could do some last minute things before we had to leave. That left me alone in our motel room to get ready before he returned. It was brutally hot outside, and I decided to do my hair and makeup in just my underwear, so I wouldn't be sweating in my nice dress the whole time. The way this motel was laid out, the sink and mirror were in the general open area of the room, with the toilet and shower in another room. So anyone walking by our room window could see me standing at the mirror. However, I did have the curtains closed. But these curtains were a little bit sheer, so you could technically see the shadow of someone walking by on the outside, or could maybe see the silhouette of me inside the room. 
I was curling my hair in the mirror when I noticed the silhouette of a man walking by my room window. As he's passing my window, I see him stop and start trying to look into my window. At first I thought it was my husband trying to see if I was ready, so I paid no mind to it. But the longer the guy stood there, bobbing his head around trying to get a better look through the curtains, I began to realize it was not my husband, because obviously, why wouldn't he just come in? Now I'm starting to get a little freaked out. Before I could do anything though, I watched as this guy started to go for my room door. My utter shock and horror came when he actually was able to open the door and walked inside. Before my husband left, he forgot to pull the door shut all the way till it clicked into its lock. He was very upset at himself when I told him this later. So now I am face to face with this man and I'm in my underwear no less, who's at least six feet tall and standing in my room. I thought to myself, this is it, he's going to attack you. That's a very scary realization to have. I also thought to myself, you're going to have to burn his eye sockets out with this curling iron if you want to survive. For a few seconds he just stood there staring at me like I was a piece of meat and he was starving, ready to pounce on me like prey. He then began to smile the most evil looking, toothy grin I've ever seen and started mumbling something under his breath. I couldn't make out what he was saying completely, but I did make out the words pretty lady and come here. I don't know if it was the fight or flight response, but I suddenly got pissed. I charged towards him and was ready to strike him with my hot curling iron. I screamed as loud as I could get the hell out of here. It must have startled him because he jumped back out onto the balcony of the motel. I saw this as my chance and I ran for the door. I luckily was able to get to the door and slam it shut right before he was about to make his second attempt at entering inside. I immediately collapsed on the floor sobbing. I literally was too scared to move from that spot until my husband came back about 15 minutes later. I told him the whole thing and he was freaked out. He initially wanted to find the guy so he could beat the crap out of him, but I refused to let him leave my side. He must have apologized 1,000 times during the rest of our trip for not making sure that the door was locked before leaving. But I told him that the day and that whole trip really was so rushed I could see how it happened. We went to the motel management and told them the whole story. The police were obviously called and I gave them a description of the guy so they could see if it was someone who was staying in the motel. After going around to the few motel occupants, they said no one matched his description and concluded he wasn't staying there. Obviously, we were late to the wedding that day, and the whole experience just ruined what should have been a happy time. We planned on staying another day before our long drive home, but we both just wanted out of there as soon as possible. We skipped most of the reception, went back to the motel, packed up, and left. I am usually always so vigilant with locking my doors, especially when I'm home alone. Just goes to show you, all it takes is that one time you forget to check your locks, and that certain unwanted guest is inviting themselves in. Hey, I would like to start off by saying I absolutely love this subreddit. This is my first post ever, so sorry if it's long. I was really inspired to share my story here after seeing so many similar ones, even if mine in no way compares to what happens to some. I'll first give a little backstory to my living situation. I was about 10, possibly 11 when my mom found a job working as a live-in manager at a quaint little motel at the end of my town. She took the job, we packed up and left my childhood home. When we first moved in, it was a disaster. Holes everywhere, certain parts of the house smelled horrible, we later learned this was because the old manager, Steve, was a druggie and his wife was making and dealing meth out of there. Couple months into living there we had sort of fixed the place up and made it livable. At this point my mom was working full time at the desk. We had mostly stayed towards the back of the house because of the odd setup, the way the front desk where you check in is laid out was basically in our living room. It was a tiny, cramped room with just a desk on one side and a door on the other, which led to our living room. A lot, and I mean a lot of people decided to just open that door whenever they pleased and often got a view of whatever video game my brother and I were playing. This as a kid already freaked me out and because of the motel's past, many meth heads came by looking for Steve and would walk right in when they didn't believe my mom when she said they didn't work slash live there any longer. 
One time, during summer break a year or two after we moved in, I decided to stay up all night and play video games. I made a little nest in the living room and made myself comfy. It was around 1 in the morning after hours of Skyrim when I started to hear weird noises. Usually, if my mom knew a regular would be late, she would leave a key in an envelope for them. Which, looking back, doesn't seem smart at all. I heard talking. It sounded like two men speaking a different language. I figured that's what they were doing and would leave in a second. But they never did. The talking continued for ten minutes before I started to hear them pull on the door. First it was gentle, as if they were testing it. As they continued it seemed to get more frantic and I could almost hear grunting. Soon it was full of banging on the door. I was confident my parents would hear it, but their room was all the way in the back of the house, which was about three hallways down so after a minute I figured I was screwed and probably going to die. I was a super paranoid kid. The banging stopped and after a few seconds, I started to hear tapping at the window behind the desk in the house. I clearly saw a head from behind the curtain. The windows were high up and he looked to be stretching up to get it. He started to yank on the window, trying to break it open. While he was doing this, I saw movement at the screen door in the kitchen. At this point, I was absolutely shitting myself. I was petrified. I'm guessing the guy who was at the desk door had now circled around to the screen door while his buddy was praying at the window. He jiggled the doorknob back and forth, after a second resuming what he was doing earlier and now banging on that door full force. For some reason, through my fear I decided to try and be a ninja, to up my sneak level of course, and the army crawled into the little office part connected to the desk. There was a key drop-off where people could just shove their keys into when they checked out that was basically just a hole in the wall. I popped up, all while they were still banging on the door, and grabbed a pencil to lift up the flap. I don't know what I expected to see, they were clearly at the side of the house, but I just had a horrible feeling, like I was being surrounded. Turns out I was right, when I lifted it, I saw two more men standing at the door, hands in their pockets. I immediately closed it and almost cried. During this, I failed to notice the hallway light turned on and my parents emerged, looking very distraught. As soon as my dad turned on the kitchen light and shouted, what the hell? All the noise stopped and the guys took off running. I could hear one of them shout something and then nothing, just complete silence. After I told my parents what happened the best I could through hysterics, they called the police. The police showed up about an hour later and took the report. It didn't seem like this happened to anyone else in the town, but they seemed to think it was some Mexican workers who came up for the hops farms and maybe didn't understand we were closed. I don't know, it seems like they were just kind of race blaming, but I never really got an explanation of that night. All I knew was that they didn't seem friendly, and I don't know what they would have done if they got in. So, to those four mystery men outside my house, let's not meet. After graduation, I had to move back to my crappy little hometown with my parents. This city has never been a place you could feel safe in, and my neighborhood has never been considered as one of the nicer ones. I grew up hearing stories and reading headlines about all the shitty things people do to each other so close to my bedroom. After a few years of exploring the city and never having anything more than wolf whistles threaten my well-being, I had grown compliant and trusting towards the mass of strangers I called neighbors. My parents have always been paranoid about home security, so even at 21, I don't have a house key. They're afraid I'll host wild parties or house hobos while they're at work. I've spent many an afternoon parked in the driveway, seat fully reclined, feet out the window, headphones on high, with a Wi-Fi connected phone in my hand. If no one is home to open the door, I'm stuck there. I was supposed to have lunch with an old friend from high school, but she canceled at the last minute. That left me looking forward to at least five hours of driveway redditing while everyone I knew was working or out of town. About three hours and I noticed a pickup pull up on the other side of the street. It wasn't someone with a key to my house, so I went back to killing zombies with vegetables. Fifteen minutes passed and I got this really uneasy feeling. I finished up my level and glanced at my mirrors. I nearly peed on myself. A man was standing in my driveway, close enough to my trunk he could have been molesting my tail lights. 
I let out a yelp and yank my headphones out of my ears. He was gangly, well over six feet, buzzed blonde hair, and had the creepiest smile I'd ever seen. I could tell by the pick marks and rotted teeth he was hooked on more than just phonics, and he was flying pretty high for 3 p.m. on a Wednesday. I didn't mean to scare you, he said, arms raised to show he didn't have anything in his hands. Oh no, I was just startled. I really should be more observant. Is there anything I can help you with? I was still shaking, but that was just the residual adrenaline. I didn't have any reason to be afraid of this guy. These little alarms going off in my head were just paranoia from too much law and order SVU. I'm sorry, he took a few steps closer to the driver's door, I just needed directions to the nearest motel. I'm working in the area, but don't live here. I was still a bit flustered, but I gave a brief description of all the local inn, motels, and gave him directions to the one he picked. It happened to the closest one to my house, but I didn't really think about that. I'm not sure I'll be able to follow that. It's a bit complicated. Could I just follow you there? I'll pay you gas money for it. Now I'm really getting creeped out. He never dropped his smile, not even when he talked. No thank you, I said, trying to let him know I'm done talking and that he should leave. It's really easy. One right and two lefts, it'll be on the left. You can't miss it. He was silent for a few seconds longer than normal, just staring. I was about to roll up my window when he blurted out, Were you sleeping? I was not prepared for this question, or really any question not related to directions or bed bugs. I replied, Um, no. I was slightly embarrassed at the fact that some guy tweaked out of his mind thought my behavior was weird, so I started scrambling for some excuse. I left my key, and I'm just waiting for my mother to get home. As soon as the words were out of my mouth, I remembered the big rule my dad used to tell me when I had to be in public by myself, never let them know you're alone. His smile somehow stretched, showing more rotted teeth and neglected gums. So a right and two lefts, he confirmed, head tilting to get a better look into my little car. I couldn't help but think he looked like a psychotic emoticon. It'll be on the left. I began to shrink back into my upholstery, I promise. Well, it doesn't sound very far. I guess if I can't find it, I can always come back for more help. He walked back to his truck and just sat there, staring out his window in my direction, that smile still in place. Twenty minutes passed before he left. I decided that Mickey D's internet was just as good as my own and hunkered down in the parking lot until I got called home. Three weeks passed and I had forgotten about the tweaker creeper until I saw a vaguely familiar truck parked up my street. I drove by trying to figure out where I'd seen it before and I saw him sitting in the driver's seat. That smile is still there. He waved and I waved back. His car is back on the street tonight, but he isn't in it. After talking to my mom the other day, I just remembered a shady encounter my brother had. When I was eight, my entire family moved from San Diego County to the middle of freaking nowhere in Colorado. After less than two years of being there and having to put up with the ridiculous weather, my oldest brother decided he'd finally had enough. He got his GED, packed up all his things in his crappy car, left his ferrets behind for us to take care of since they're illegal in California, and headed west to move in with a friend. Or, at least he tried to. He didn't even make it five hours before his car completely died because it couldn't handle driving through the Rockies. He was stranded in a tiny podunk town after dark. His car got towed to a garage while the tow truck driver offered to drive him to a cheap, but nice, motel to spend the night since we couldn't come get him until the next day. They passed by a Motel 6 or some other chain motel like that, but the driver said, Ugh. I wouldn't leave my dog in that place. There's a nicer motel just down the road for the same price. The driver kept driving until they showed up at this really rundown looking place. My brother thought it looked pretty bad, but he's kind of a shy and non-confrontational person, plus he's scrawny and completely unintimidating, so he didn't say anything and just thanked the guy. He couldn't see it at night, but when my mom and I got there the next day, we realized just how weird the place was. They had a big pool right smack in the middle of the parking lot, 
but it was drained dry and looked like it had never been used. The entire family that owned the motel sat on plastic lawn chairs in between the pool and the building. The front desk was in, facing the motel rooms, all day long. Then we saw the inside of his room. The bathroom had a small window, which isn't unusual, but it was only two feet off the ground and next to the toilet with nothing covering it or obstructing the view of anyone using the toilet, meaning anyone outside could watch you doing your business. There wasn't even a spot for a toilet paper holder, so the roll just had to sit on a shelf, and the whole room looked pretty run down. My brother then quietly told us he barely got any sleep the night before because he was so terrified. At first we assumed it was just because he was sleeping in a strange place by himself when he was only 17, but he pointed out a door near his bed. His room was the kind where it's connected to the room next to it by a hallway only a few feet long with a door in each room, so large families staying in adjacent rooms can keep it open and get between the two without having to deal with keys. He said he heard faint noises coming from the room next to his the night before, so he opened his door to see what was going on, and there was enough of a gap underneath to see that someone was standing right on the other side of the far door. My brother watched for a few minutes, and the guy's shadow never shifted, so he got creeped out and closed his own door, making sure to lock it, and went to bed. He woke up at some point to a strange sound and sat there trying to identify it for a minute before he suddenly realized it was a doorknob rattling. The guy had finally opened his own door and was trying to get into my brother's room. The sound stopped after a few minutes, but he was too scared to fall back asleep in case the guy tried again and picked the lock, and he was telling us the story quietly just in case the guy could hear him through the walls. He never saw what he looked like, but who knows if the guy watched him while he checked into the room or something. I have no idea if he was planning on kidnapping my brother or what, but I'm sure he was up to no good. When I was 17, I moved to college two hours away from home and took residence in the dorms on campus. The dorms were not run through the school, but through a management company. There were a lot of safety problems in the dorms as a result of this, assaults, ODs, drugs, shootings, etc. I am a 100-pound female, so I always watched out for serious situations around me. Everything was great. I had some awful roommates, but I was mostly left alone. One day in September, I was leaving for class early in the morning when I spotted a condom taped to my name tag on the door. It had a note that said, call me with some random phone number. I told the RAs and nothing came of it, I just thought it was some random prank pulled by one of the guys on the floor. Things went south with my roommates, mostly because of my night terrors scaring them, even though I warned them before we even agreed to be roommates. So I was moved into a two-bedroom dorm with my new roommate named Jenny. Me and Jenny each had our own room. After a week of living there, I started noticing that things were appearing in the living room while we were sleeping. I asked Jenny about it, and she vehemently denied it was her. One day we noticed that the lock on the front door did not lock properly. If you pulled on the lock and twisted the handle at the same time, the door would come open. Around the same time, I started getting Snapchats of inappropriate things, vague threats, and offers for great sex. I would get ones that would say things like, you look great today with that specific article of clothing I was wearing. I filed a report to the dorms to get the lock fixed, but it took four months, eight complaints, threat of legal action, and my friend Deanna yelling at them to get any action. We got our door fixed, but the presence still appeared outside of the door with notes for me. I was still receiving Snapchats, but I moved out of the dorms into an apartment with my then-boyfriend. The Snapchats continued, then I started getting calls at my work. I worked for the dean's office of my college, and I was in charge of answering phones. Every day I would get three or more calls from randomly generated numbers, which was discovered it was through apps like Viber and Skype after I reported it to the police and they investigated. When I would answer the phone, I would hear heavy breathing for a few seconds, then they would hang up. I thought it was just some 12-year-old pranking our office until my coworker got a call. She answered with her name, and the person on the line asked if they could speak with me. Thinking it was one of the deans that I had been working with, she forwarded it to my phone. I answered and I received the same heavy breathing and hung up. I reported it to my boss. She did nothing. One of the deans overheard the conversation and reported it to Title IX. 
Oh boy, talking to them was a mistake. After the meeting with them, the threats started getting worse, and this person found me in my new apartment. One day in December, I was dog-sitting two wonderful dogs who hated other dogs and would bark at them on sight. It was around 11 p.m. and I decided to take them out before bed. We get outside. To the right of me is a bunch of thick trees that are hard to see through. I start to take the girls to the grass on the left. They start growling and barking at something in the trees. Thinking it's another dog, I try to pull them away, but they will not budge. I glance over and out of the trees comes a tall man, but the weird thing is he is wearing a Michael Myers-like mask. He starts rushing towards me. The dogs get between me and him. He stops. I run up the stairs behind me into the apartment as he is disappearing into the trees again. Stupidly, I don't call the police, but I see him one more time before I move to my new apartment. Things are quiet for a while. My boyfriend and I break up, and I spend the first few days in the new apartment alone. Come to find out, the window that can be accessed from the ground doesn't lock. One morning I wake up. Everything seems normal. I check the mirror to do my hair for work. I have a bald spot. My head was shaved in the middle of the night. I find my hair tied up in knots in an envelope. I immediately call the police. They do an investigation, find the window was broken, but can't find anything to figure out who it was that came into my apartment. They asked me to compile a list of everything that was missing. The only thing gone other than my hair were three pairs of dirty underwear. The investigation found no one. I have since moved. I no longer answer phones at my work, and I keep bear spray next to my bed at all times. I have been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon, and felt comfortable in the woods, and have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of empty Jefferson, Oregon. I found some coordinates of a campsite which we found to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need privacy since they are intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It was not an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off a USFS road that had flat ground full trees and a fire pit. The first night my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours, it was maybe two feet away from me and my wife's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep with her in the tent. The German Shepherd's name is Guts. That whole first night neither my wife and I could sleep, we both heard footsteps, they were heavy, not like typical forest critters scampering around the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from reading recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and my rifle with me. The dogs are a great at detection, and that is why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night which I ultimately decided was deer or maybe some elk. In the morning of day two, we go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away see the circle area in the photo. I see an abandoned road where a rusted gatepost was covered in vegetation. Something of blue color caught my eye and Guts immediately took off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race because I think it's another family camping like us and he is going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So, I chase after him as fast as I can and the rest follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road and me yelling his name, but I have covered just enough distance to see that there is nobody there and something is off about the sight. I yell, hello is anyone there, sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I got closer I knew something was wrong, it had all the necessities for a campsite including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed and torn from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles puzzled why anyone would leave all their camping gear behind including an expensive REI tent. I figured well someone left in a hurry and animals got to the rest as the only logical explanation. Still a propane tank and cooler were flattened by something and it certainly wasn't a snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. 
As the afternoon rolls in, me and my daughter are playing bocce ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I do not have direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight towards her. Normally he would always be with me unless he was called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention and I knew something weird was happening, so I ran over there and my wife started jogging at me. I immediately draw my pistol. Guts had completely continued running into the forest another 100 feet before I called him and he stopped. My other dog Leah, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking points. I have had her for seven years now and this was the first time in her life she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was fully raised and attached to us at the hip. Again any time we hike or play, Leah is up front bossing everything in her path and pauses to look to see where we are and continues. I asked my wife what happened and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hairs raise. I know someone was watching me, then I saw Guts running towards me, and I just got up to move towards you. We spent ten minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something went. We decide to spend one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we will all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can, some coins, and keys from our truck to zip tie it, so anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the same exact thing I have done with a rope that was so old and brown, I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remain. But sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height off the ground and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt someone had stayed here before and put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree I was maybe 10 to 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure the girls felt we were safe, and at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came around. I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my pistol into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we are armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that now knows we have two wolves and are armed and we are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps, the dogs never perked up or barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 Hunted documentary, I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend and a flood of dread rushes to me. I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent, smashed cooler, cooktop. We have been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped and we all thank our lucky star guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. For some context, I'm a 32-year-old female. This happened to me when I was about 25 or 26. I work full-time as a researcher at a university, which is where these encounters took place. I'm not a professor or anything, and because of my age at the time, I could have easily been mistaken for just another student wandering around campus. On some days, when the weather was nice, I would prefer to spend my lunch hour strolling around the university grounds outside or sitting underneath a shady tree on a bench enjoying the time I was not sitting in a cramped corner of a lab. On one of these days, I was sitting on a bench enjoying the fresh air, and a male student walking by asked if he could sit next to me. I'm a pretty shy and awkward kind of person, so even though I really would have preferred sitting alone, I said, sure. He initiated a simple conversation, to which I obliged, but was careful not to be too forthcoming. He mentioned he had seen which departmental building I came and went from, which slightly alarmed me, given I had never seen this person before in my life. But I pushed the thought from my mind. After all, the weather had been decent lately, and I had spent nearly all my lunch hours for the past week outside. He asked if I was studying within the mentioned department, to which I told him that I was not a student, but rather I worked there. He told me he was an engineering student, and then followed up with asking me out to coffee sometime. 
I apologized and told him that I had a boyfriend and would have to decline. We parted ways after that, and I assumed I probably wouldn't see him around again. About a week or two went by, and I was spending another lunch hour outside on campus, sitting on a different bench somewhere. Seemingly out of nowhere, the same man from before asked if he could sit next to me again. Admittedly, I don't remember what he started talking to me about at first. My mind was reeling, and I was rather uncomfortable having to potentially turn this guy down a second time. Sure enough, he asked me again if we could go out for coffee sometime. I apologized and reminded him that I had a boyfriend and would not be meeting him for coffee. And again, he left after that. I was feeling rather anxious now, but it still hadn't reached a level where I felt I had to be too concerned. A few days later, I had finished work and was leaving the building to walk to where I had parked my car. The university charges a fortune for parking passes, even if you're employed by them, so I had always opted for free street parking about a 10-minute walk away from campus. My walking route would take me down several quiet residential streets with minimal car traffic. Even pedestrian traffic was pretty sparse on the busiest of days. It wasn't until I was about halfway to my car, down one of these quiet back streets, that I noticed someone walking directly across the street from me, but keeping a few paces behind. I noticed him from my peripheral vision, and didn't want to flat out turn around to stare at him. It wasn't uncommon to see someone else by any means, I was just always trying to be aware of my surroundings when walking the streets alone. I had to make a few turns coming up anyways, and the chance that they would be going the same way as me was slim. But he did. He made all the turns I did, still walking on the sidewalk across from me, a few steps behind. I still did not want to look at whoever this was. I didn't want him to know that I was aware of what I thought he was doing. I quickened my pace to a speedy walk. I was approaching the first of two busier streets before I would reach my car. His pace quickened to keep up with me. That was the moment I panicked. The moment I was sure that he was indeed following me. After that, I started a full-out jog to cross the first of the busier streets. He ran to keep up behind me and was now on the same side of the street I was. I was now nearly in my car. I had to cross the last busy street and get about 100 meters and I would be there. But it was crossing the street that worried me. I often had to stop and wait a good minute or so before it was clear enough to do so. If this were the case, he would catch up with me. As if the stars aligned, as soon as I made it running to the busy street, I had a gap to cross. I booked it as fast as I could, finally turning around once I had made it, to look and yell at the man who had been pursuing me. It was him. I could have suspected, but now it was confirmed. It was the engineering student whom I had turned down for coffee. Stop following me, I yelled at him from across the busy street. Can I just talk to you? He yelled back. I didn't even answer him. I mean, the answer should have been obvious from the start, and I was certainly never going to give my time to anyone who had just followed and then chased me for about one kilometer. I keep moving quickly to my car, so determined to get the hell out of there that I didn't even care if he saw which car was mine. He had given up following me and never tried to cross the road too, to my relief. I got home and broke down. I mean, worse things had happened to other people, no doubt, and I was not harmed, fortunately. But I was shaken. I had some anxieties walking to and from work after that. It wasn't long before a co-worker and I would walk most of the distance back to our cars together after work. I even changed where I started parking, for a time. A few weeks had passed since the incident, and I had not seen him around campus at all. I had started spending my lunches in the lab instead of outside, but occasionally, I would go to the student center to buy lunch instead. This one particular day, the food court in the student center was packed, almost shoulder to shoulder. I was standing in line at a burger stall, and I heard a guy try and get someone's attention through the crowd. I look up, and it's him again, waving to me and trying to make his way through the people. I panicked, and even though I'm terribly shy... I started a scene and yelled to him to leave me the hell alone. His face dropped instantly as people stared at us, and he slinked back into the sea of students. My heart was pounding, and I was shaking. I don't even remember if I ended up getting food after that. 
I went back to work, and from then on, was even more focused on my surroundings than I ever was before. It's been five or six years since then, and I still work at the university. I am so relieved to say I never saw him again after the food court and haven't had any other harrowing accounts on campus. I am still diligent about being aware of my surroundings, especially when I have to walk to and from campus alone. I never asked the guy his name, so I couldn't even report an incident to campus police or anything. All in all, I'm just glad I never saw him again, and I can only hope he never did this to any other girl before or after me. Hey everyone, so I'm a guy from the UK. I live in a town in Wales, albeit not the little villages most people imagine. My town is a popular holiday destination along the coast of Wales. This isn't overly relevant to the story, but I just thought I would give everyone some context. I did actually post this story on a separate Reddit account several years ago in a different subreddit, however, I highly exaggerated it for the sake of story and this was a creative writing subreddit I believe. I can't fully remember, I just remember the story I told wasn't totally honest. So if you think you've read something similar before, then you probably have. This is the full truth of what happened and is likely way less exciting than the original story, but I will. So it started when I was around 15 years old, about 8 years ago. I was dating a girl from about 2 towns over. I would usually get the train to hers and back, however, this one night her family weren't supposed to be home and we were kind of being watched by her brother, who was about 19 to 20 and was pretty chill. The plan was to stay the night. We were up late playing on the way, but her parents unexpectedly came home. I never got along with her mother and the whole thing got kind of heated. I was kicked out of the house and told I couldn't stay over. It was about 2 a.m. and I didn't want to call my own parents and worry of waking them up so I began the long trudge home. It was roughly about an hour and a quarter worth of walking so I was expecting to be home by around half four. So I walked along the weird concrete bit just above the beach, not sure what it's called, and I stopped after about half an hour of walking as there is a public toilet which is kind of run down, but also open 24 hours and I was desperate. I was expecting it to be empty or just have a homeless dude sleeping in it, but I was wrong. There was a guy using the urinal. This guy looked to be in his mid to late 50s maybe. A little on the overweight side, but not extremely. He had gray messy-ish hair, but other than that he looked pretty normal. He definitely didn't look homeless. I remember he made a quick joke about something, but I don't remember what. I politely laughed, did my business, and left. After about another 15 minutes of walking the weather had gotten pretty bad. Started to rain heavily and the wind was picking up. I seem to remember this was around November time, so it was pretty cold. Anyways, so I'm walking and a car drives by, beeps, and pulls over just in front of me. I had assumed it was someone I knew but couldn't think who. Got to the car and the dude from the toilet was inside. He asked me where I was headed and I told him. He said that was a long walk and I couldn't be expected to walk all that way in this weather and he offered me a lift. In hindsight, I probably should have refused, but the weather was bad and at. The time he wasn't giving off any weird vibes. The drive took about 15 minutes I think, maybe 20. The more I was in the car with him the more I started to get vibes that there was something off about this guy. He was telling me his best friend was a 14 year old lad who stays over at his place a lot and they drink together and if I ever wanted to join I was welcome to. He was asking me some really invasive questions as well. I don't fully remember what they were. I just remember it's not the kind of questions you ask to someone that you're giving a simple lift home to. Anyways, we got to the street around the corner from my place and I asked him to just drop me off there. I told him my house wasn't accessible by road and that I would walk the rest of the way. He gave me his number and told me to ring him when I got back to my house safely as he wanted to make sure I got home okay. I asked him what his name was, as at this point he knew my full name, and he just said Pete. I said, Pete, what? My phone wants a surname. He wouldn't tell me. Just kept saying, just call me Pete. I later found out that Pete was a fake name, too. Anyway, I got into my house and texted him, just to let him know I was home safe. 
Probably a bad decision, but back then I was full of bad decisions to be honest. The next day came and I was expecting everything to go back to normal. It didn't, because I stupidly gave Pete my number when I texted him. Started to get texts from him every morning basically just saying good morning to me and wishing me well. I replied to the first few and then started ignoring them. He then started trying to ring me. Every single evening. I would ignore most of his calls, but he would often repeatedly ring until I answered. He was sending me these texts inviting me over to his house for some drinks. He kept telling me he'd just gotten himself a pool table and wanted me to come and play it with him. He was telling me a story of a friend he was playing pool with, the 14-year-old I was talking about, and accidentally let slip that the guy called him John. I asked him about this and said, I thought your name was Pete. He said, oh, no. My friend's name is John. I said you just said your friend called you, John. And you told me your friend was called Tom. He said, oh, well. Some people call me John. It's like a nickname. But his name is John too. He hesitated saying this and I kind of clicked that he was telling me a bunch of lies. I kept refusing but he kept asking. After a while, my mom wanted to know who this dude who kept texting me and ringing me was. I told her and she rang him herself from her phone and told him that if he carried on texting and ringing me she would be calling the police. I didn't get any more texts from him after that. But it didn't end there. I had a routine, you see. And he knew it. I always walked my dog at half four every afternoon and played with her for 40 minutes on the field at the end of my street, just near where he had dropped me off. I started to notice his car pulling up there within five minutes of me getting there with my dog. He had tinted windows, but I would always notice the car lights were always left on and the engine was always running. Also, I recognized his car. I would occasionally notice the car door open and a large flash from that direction as if someone was taking pictures. I started changing the time I walked my dog but he would eventually figure it out and start showing up either earlier or late to coincide with when I was walking her. This went on for months and I never mentioned it to anyone but one day it just stopped. He stopped pulling up at the side of the field. I never saw his car anymore. Not text messages or phone calls from him. It all just stopped. I ended up getting a new phone after about a year and had that for another two years. I dug out my old phone when I was around 18 to 19 after the aforementioned dog died. I had some old pictures and videos of her on that phone and wanted to transfer them over to my PC so that I always had them. I turned on a phone which had been turned off for several years now and still had the old SIM in it. That's when I got my final message from Pete. It was an odd one and was about 14 months old. It said something along the lines of, Hi, I know we haven't spoken in a while, but I just thought you should know that over New Year I was diagnosed with an illness and I've been told I don't have long left to live. You were a good friend in the short time we knew each other. I live at this address and would really appreciate it if you could come around just so I can have a last chat with you. I've got some beers in and if it gets too late you can stay the night. Just drop me a phone call when you want to come around so that I can get everything ready for you. See you soon no idea if Pete or John was genuinely ill or just trying to lure me to his house. Never been to the address he sent me and never responded to him or heard from him since. I didn't reply to him and that was the last I heard from the guy. So yeah, that's the story. Not tremendously exciting, but kind of had a big impact on me during those years. Hope you all enjoyed it.